All right, everyone. Um, we'll probably kick this off because we do have quite a bit to get through and we obviously want to get through to the Q&A. Good morning. Thank you all so much for, for being here today and thank you for joining us and so close to Christmas. Um, like we said when we sent everything out, businesses are wrapping up, but it doesn't seem like that when it comes to employment law. It is full steam ahead and there are definitely um, things that are not slowing down, which we're going to talk about today. And today's webinar is all about the closing loopholes bill and explaining the bill in detail. So before we get fully into it, before I introduce our guest speaker, I just want to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn and work. Uh, my name is Sanam. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Like I said, I am the Employment Council here at Employment Hero, and I am joined by our amazing guest speaker, Simon O.V., who is the Principal Lawyer at EI Legal. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for being here. We are really lucky to have you. Uh, can we get a bit of background information about you and, and your employment law background? Yes, sure. Um, well, good morning, um, Sanam, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, so I'm Simon. I've been a employment lawyer for uh, as long as I can remember, originally in the UK and, and out here for the last 10 or so years. So I head up EI Legal, which is part of the employment uh, innovations families of companies. So like Employment Hero, we, we exist to make employment easier and we do that by providing um, outsourced HR and payroll services and then EI Legal is, is an employment law firm and helps businesses of all shapes and sizes with everything to do with uh, employment law. Oh, that's brilliant. So, yeah, didn't I tell everyone that we're really lucky to have Simon here today? It's it's going to be a wealth of, of knowledge and we're, we're absolutely excited to get it underway. And thank you again, Simon. Uh, before we, we get fully into it, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. So we've allocated time at the end of the webinar for, for questions. So please type your questions in the, the box down at the bottom of your Zoom screens. And look, to be honest, Simon and I have been training for this. We are ready to tackle all these questions at the end, but obviously we might not be able to get through all of them. And um, the ones that we can't get through, we will definitely endeavor to try to answer them after the webinar. But our aim is to get through as many as we can. And please also know that today's webinar session is going to be recorded. So the slides will also be provided to you. It'll be recorded. There are a lot of dates that we're going to cover. So I don't want to see anybody frantically writing them down. <laughs> please. Please take your time, sit back, enjoy, you know, a coffee, tea, and or maybe a sip of drink, I don't know, and enjoy the webinar, because uh, we, we definitely have a lot to cover with this, this uh, closing loopholes bill. Now, before we fully get started, I just want to do a bit of a disclaimer. This is just a quick one, just to say that these are our views, and they are provided in good faith. They are not legal advice. Now, if you do need legal advice, and you are dealing with a very specific situation in the workplace, or maybe questions coming out of this that are quite tailored to your business, then we have, like I said, Simon here, and EI Legal's contacts will be, and Simon's contacts will be um, put in at the at the end of the, the webinar. So definitely stay around <laughs> for Simon's contact details, and, um, and otherwise it will be provided in the webinar slides. So when we're looking at these changes that have come up, Simon, I think one of the things that we probably need to look at is that we've had a big year in 2023. Uh, like I said, employment law hasn't slowed down and there has been quite a lot of changes that have come up. And I would say that this has probably been the biggest year yet. Simon, would you be able to go through and let us know what has changed in 2023, what people needed to look out for and, and maybe what's coming up as well? Yeah, sure. So I, I know everyone will want to hear about the uh, closing loopholes stuff, but we thought as it was the end of the year, we should just do a, a quick sprint through the other changes in 2023. So I'll do this very quickly. If you do need um, more assistance with any of this stuff, just do reach out. OK, so uh, going back to the beginning of 2023, um, 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave was introduced for all employees, including casuals. So that in came into effect on the 1st of Feb for um, businesses with 15 or more employees, and then um, 1st of August for smaller businesses. Then in uh, March, we had a big uh, 
court decision about uh, public holiday work, which really changed the way that the uh, Fair Work Act had been interpreted. And in a nutshell, it basically says that where you have an employee that you want to work on a public holiday, you can't just make a requirement that they uh, do so. You have to make a request, which they have an opportunity to accept or decline but they can only decline on reasonable grounds. So it's just adding an extra step in the process of, of engaging someone to do public holiday work. Um, then in May, we had some changes to uh, the annual shutdown provisions in modern awards. And what the uh, new rules most importantly say is that where someone doesn't have enough annual leave to cover a, a shutdown, such as a Christmas shutdown, and a award employee can't be required to take leave without pay. Um, that is also the um, situation for award-free employees, but that was made clear for um, award-covered employees uh, early this year. Then um, we had, on the 7th of June, uh, new provisions around the ban on pay secrecy clauses so these the rules around this came into effect on various different dates but on 7th of june there was at, an actual offense created so an employer can be subject to um, significant penalties if they put a pay secrecy clause in a contract or, or a policy going forward uh, under the law now employees are free to choose to discuss their pay um, with their colleagues if they wish to, and that can't be um, prohibited in the workplace. Um, then also on the same date, there were some changes to the rules about dealing with requests for flexible working and requests for extensions of parental leave, um, just making a, a more onerous process that has to be followed. So you might need to look at your processes and uh, policies in that area if you haven't uh, done so recently. Um, then moving on to the next slide, uh, 1st of July, there were some quite sweeping changes to the rules about parental leave. Um, previously, uh, where you had both parents taking parental leave, they could only take up to 24 months between them. Now they can each take 24 months um, uh, regardless of what the other one does. Um, there's no limits on the amount of leave that can be taken at the same time. It used to be only eight weeks could be taken by parents at the same time. And we now have, uh, in terms of the government uh, funded um, paid parental leave program, you used to have uh, two weeks for dads and partners and 18 weeks for the um primary carer, it's now rolled up into a single 20 week entitlement for both parents to share as they see fit. And we also have 100 days parental leave that can be taken flexibly. So that's the idea of um, you, you, you take a chunk of parental leave usually, and then you come back to work. Now you can keep in your back pocket, as it were, up to 100 days to be taken flexibly at ad hoc days up to the child's second birthday. Um, then uh, at 6th of December, we had new rules, which means that employees can't be on a fixed term contract for more than two years or under a fixed term contract that is renewed more than once, subject to some very limited exceptions in the legislation. Um, we then had sunsetting of zombie agreements. So any enterprise agreement that was made prior to 1st of Jan 2010 automatically uh, disappeared um, uh, into the ether. And then 12th of December, 2023, we had um, uh, new rules in respect of the positive duty to eliminate sexual harassment and sex discrimination. That duty actually came in the year previously, but the regulator didn't have any powers to enforce that until 12th of December this year. Um, so uh, if you haven't updated your policies and procedures for dealing with that, um, it, it is high time to do so. Um, and then finally, on the 30th of December, we're going to have new rules about deductions from pay. Um, prior to this, an employee where they are making an authorization for pay to be deducted, it has to be in a specified amount. You can't give a 
authorization for their variable amounts going forward. Um, you'd need a new authorization every time. These rules make it a bit simpler and, and an employee can make a, an authorization for deductions of varying amounts. Um, so uh, that is one one positive thing. Uh, that that is that is uh, 2023 wrapped. That that was that was quite a well, good way to sum it up, Simon. <laughs> um, so clearly, there's been a lot that's changed, and as Simon said, it is worthwhile to go back, have a look at your contracts, your policies, make sure they're all in line, especially with some of the things changing last year. But now the the powers or the authority being able to kind of move in and and penalize businesses or employers. So I think it is really important to go back and have a look, and also just. As a refresher as well, there's a lot of times in employment law where, you know, employers, you're doing a day to day in your business and you just don't go back and look at the contracts or the policies. So it's a good, good, good way to do it. Now, um, why we're all here <laughs> is the closing loopholes bill. Look, I don't think anyone really saw this coming. Um, to be honest, it was it was something that. Usually things don't move this quickly in employment law, but they will, you know, here and there, like the public holidays, all of a sudden we had we had a case come out. But um, Simon, on the 14th of December, there was a lot of change that was brought about um, when it came to this employment law space. Can you please let us know exactly what has happened about uh, with the closing loopholes bill and, and what does this all mean? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Now, you're absolutely right. It, it's all happened very um, quickly and unexpectedly. So just as a kind of recap of what's happened to date. The bill was introduced by the government in September, covering a whole raft of um, stuff to do with employment law. Um, uh, and we thought that was going to be debated, you know, um, and, and wouldn't be passed until at some point in 2024. But then um, sort of overnight in this early December, the government Kind of struck a, a a a deal with some independent senators uh, and were able to uh, in effect split the bill in two and get the less controversial parts of the bill approved basically overnight leaving the more controversial stuff to be debated um in parliament next year so uh so that 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 those new provisions were approved on on um seventh of december re retrieved uh, received royal assent on the fourteenth of december and so from the fifteenth of december we've got a whole new um load of laws which are already now in effect so we're going to talk about that next i think and then we'll return to the stuff that's still in the second part of the bill which is obviously subject to change and, and debate in parliament Perfect. And I guess what people want to know <laughs> is firstly, what's what's come up and what loopholes are being closed here? <laughs> and I, I heard that, like you said, there's a few changes that might be coming up at different times. So what's actually um, happening at the moment or what's already been passed or what are we going to see in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So on the screen, we've got um, pretty much all of the provisions um, which have now been approved. Um, some of them are already in effect and some of them will come into effect um, uh, on, on later dates. So I'll, I'll run through all the changes which, are, which um, we know are definitely happening. Um, obviously, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface on, on a lot of this stuff, but hopefully it will give you a signpost um, at the very least uh, as to what to look out for. So number one, um, there's been an amendment to the small business redundancy exemption. So as you might know, if you are a business with less than 15 employees and you make someone redundant, there is no obligation to pay redundancy pay subject to some very limited exceptions. Um, these new rules um, change that situation in insolvency proceedings. So Prior to this, you had a situation where you might have a large company, a couple of hundred staff that um, has been uh, insolvent and is being wound up as part of bankruptcy in proceedings. They would usually get rid of all of their staff or, or the vast majority of their staff and just leave a, a kind of skeleton crew of the finance team to, to you know, help with the winding up process. So that small team that was left might have gone from being under a large 
business employer to a small business employer and could then potentially lose their redundancy, redundancy pay rights. This uh, rules address that so that those people's redundancy pay entitlements will be preserved, but it's only where a business is being wound up as part of insolvency proceedings. If, if you're a small business and you're not subject to those proceedings, it's not going to affect the, the usual redundancy pay exemption. So number two is um, uh, changes to rules about labour hire uh, and the um, government's same job, same pay policy. So labour hire, as you probably know, is, is where you have one company, um, uh, company A, and they contract with company B, who is a labour hire provider, and company B will supply staff to work in company A's business. And throughout that process, company B, the labour hire um, provider, will remain the employer of the staff, but they will be working in uh, company A, which is often called the host employer. And the host employer might have some of its directly employed staff as well. Um, what these rules um, uh focus on and what they apply to is only a certain um, subset, if you like, of labour hire work. They only apply to host businesses where the host business has an enterprise agreement in place. So if you are a, a employer or a, or a business and you use labour hire um, companies to help with your workforce, but you don't have an enterprise agreement, these rules won't affect you. They just um, affect um, host employers with enterprise agreements. And really what they are aimed at is um, sort of larger businesses, perhaps in construction or mining, who have had an enterprise agreement negotiated with staff, often uh, with the involvement of, of the trade union. And that enterprise agreement provides for sort of high wages for employees. Um, Sometimes you get you would get a situation where a company like that would you would use a labour hire provider for staff. The labour hire company wouldn't be covered by the host employer's enterprise agreement, and that would mean they could pay staff um, at uh, a lesser rate under the uh, minimum wage set by the modern award. And this rule is is basically saying in a situation like that an employee or a union can make an application to the Fair Work Commission for an order that the labour hire employees are paid no less than what they would have been paid if they were employed by the direct employer under the enterprise agreement. So it is just sort of um, impacting those sorts of arrangements. Of course, um, lots of businesses don't use labour hire as a solution to you know, cut, cut wages. In fact, it can it can often be more expensive. Um, and, you know, labour hire is often used because of staff shortages or, or to get employees with a particular specialisation. But um, as I say, this this really um, focuses on, on just uh, employers with enterprise agreements where, um, you know, deliberately or undeliberately, they, they were using labour hire companies who could pay the staff a lower wage. Um, there are some exemptions, so it won't apply to host employers with less than 15 employees, um, and it won't apply to engagements of employees for less than three months. So this provision is already uh, in law, um, but the Fair Work Commission won't be able to make any orders that come into force until the 1st of November 2024, so practically speaking, and there's still a bit of time to prepare. So number three, this is probably, I think, the, the biggest change, so we'll spend a bit more time on this point than the others, and this is um, about rights um, for workplace delegates, and again, this, this has come into effect as of the 15th of December. So so, Nan, if you can go to the next slide, I've got a, a snapshot of the main provisions in the legislation, um, which you can look at, at, at your own in your own time. But if you go to the next slide again, um, I've got a summary of how, how this all works. So a workplace delegate, what, what is that? So it is an employee in your business who is a member of a union and has been a, 
appointed by the union to um, uh, be their representative in that workplace and to represent their, their colleagues at, at that place of work. So we're not talking about um, union officials who are employed by a union. We're talking about employees in your business who are members of the union and then have been appointed by the union to be the, the representative at that workplace. And the new rules are about giving uh, new rights um, and uh, powers to people appointed as workplace delegates. And, and the big, big right is a right to represent um, other workers there. So they will have a right to represent uh, other union members and anyone who is eligible to join the union. And this is one of the sort of controversial things about it. You might only have one or two members of your staff that are union members, but the workplace delegate will have a right to represent uh, anyone, not just union members, anyone eligible to be, to be a member of the union, which conceivably could be the rest of your staff. Um, it, no employee has to be represented by the workplace delegate. They can opt out or opt in, but, but certainly that, that right is there. So what, what does it mean, um, representation? What will they actually be able to do? So this is pretty woolly in the legislation. It, it is a right to represent um, their colleagues in respect of their industrial rights, which isn't um, defined, but um, that would seem to cover any aspect of um, employment law and, and workplace rights. So, um, you know, leave, hours, uh, overtime, pay, um, uh, any disputes about that sort of stuff. And obviously, um, you know, disciplinary proceedings, performance management, all of that stuff, the workplace delegate can now get involved in. And the employer will have a, an obligation to communicate with the delegate and not to hinder them in, in their work. Um, also, under the legislation, the delegate must be allowed reasonable communication with the people they represent and reasonable access to workplace facilities for doing so. So what is reasonable, of course, is, um, is very vague, but you could conceive of a situation where you're going to get demands from a workplace delegate that they need to have, uh, you know, an allocated meeting time of uh, an hour a week to meet with uh, people they're representing in a in a workplace meeting room, and of course this could be very um, disruptive. Um, the delegate uh, will be able to carry out these activities without loss of pay, and of course this is someone that has been you know, employed by the business to do a job, um, not, not employed to be a union delegate, but all of a sudden they, they're going to have all these extra responsibilities, which is going to take them away from their um, day job, and they must be allowed a reasonable time to do that. Even in addition to that, they are allowed to have time off work um, to do training with the union, um, and, and that must be paid at their usual rate. Um, this isn't an entitlement for employees who are delegates of small businesses, less than 15 employees, but for larger businesses, they will be allowed um, reasonable time off to, to do training with the union. One of the problems with the legislation, it doesn't have any rules about what notice they have to give their employer um, to do that training what the maximum amount of time they can have off and indeed what the training is on so it's 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 um definitely there are some uh challenges with the legislation there's also no limits in the legislation about the number of delegates that could be appointed so if you have a workplace with several functions you might have you know people on the tools people in the office um there might be a, a couple of different unions that could be um, uh, involved in your workplace and so you could have a number of delegates uh, appointed um, as a result of that. So the the rights in the Fair Work Act which I've just talked about are kind of the bare bones of, of, of a delegate's rights but modern awards will be amended by the 1st of July 2024 
to provide um, more detail about um, delegates' rights um, in particular industries. So there might be some, um, you know, different rights for a delegate in construction to a delegate in, um, you know, uh, childcare. But we'll have to see exactly um, how that all plays out when the awards are amended. So that is uh, a big change. Uh, um, very uh, fresh for us all. Um, okay, so if we flick back, thanks, Sanam. Um, the other stuff is should be a bit more straightforward. So number four, um, being subject to family and domestic violence is now a protected characteristic under the Fair Work Act, which means employees can't be discriminated against or adversely treated because they've been subject to family and domestic violence. Number five, is quite a technical amendment to the law. This is about the rules for protected action ballots. So where employees want to go on strike um, in, in, you know, to assert uh, rights in, in respect of negotiating an enterprise agreement, say, uh, they need to have a vote before doing so. And if that happens, the Fair Work Commission has to um, uh, call a... Uh, a conference of, of all the involved people, the union, the employees, the employer, to try and uh, avoid uh, a strike or industrial action being taken. There are some technical rules about how those conferences are conducted, um, etc. cetera. Um, number six, some more stuff about unions. Um, prior to these rules, if you... Um, have a health and safety representative in your workplace. So if employees have been, uh, uh, appointed one of their members to be a health and safety representative um, and they wanted help from a union um, re regarding doing that, the, the union would, would need a permit to be able to come on site that those rules have been relaxed. So um, now uh, any union member, whether they have a permit or not, will be able to come on site to assist them with those um, duties. Uh, again, criticism for that provision means that there's no checks and balances for, for which union um, officials could attend. That um, is um, now currently law. Number seven, some changes to the rules about um, the Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency. They're going to have more powers to um, uh, deal with silica in the workplace and uh, the problems that um, silica is causing, but we'll have to see exactly how that plays out. Number eight is all about um, workers' compensation. Um, so the usual position when someone makes a workers' compensation claim, if they have an injury, it, it's it's on them to prove that the injury was caused by uh, the workplace. Um, those rules are being flipped on their head, if you like, for first responders um, who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. So first responders, we mean ambulance workers, um, police, you know, that those types of roles, if they suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, the, there is a presumption that that will be co that, that the cause of that um, was uh, by their work. That presumption is can be challenged, but it, it is it's flipping the onus of proof from being on the employee. Um, number nine uh this won't come into effect until the first of july 2024 but we have a new uh industrial manslaughter offense so that's where um uh someone loses their life as a result of the employee uh, employer's neg negligence or recklessness um that offense uh, carries a maximum 25 years in prison or an 18 million dollar fine and then um, lastly, criminalisation of wage theft. So wage theft is already a, an offence under some state and territory um, legislation, but this brings it within the Fair Work Act. And, and it is uh, defined as an intentional, um, you know, uh, 
an intentional avoidance of, of paying employees their entitlement. So it needs to be in, intended, um, but that kind of deliberate conduct will carry a maximum of 10 years in prison or uh, a $7.8 million fine. There are some safe harbour protections, um, meaning that if you self-disclose to the Fair Work Ombudsman that there's been an underpayment, you can be protected from these uh, provisions. Um, this will come into effect on the later of the 1st of January 2025 or the date that the government publish a voluntary small business wage compliance code. Um, so uh, we've got a bit of time before that comes into effect. The, the small business wage compliance code will be a set of rules that will apply to small businesses. If they follow the code, then they will also be able to avoid those um, criminal provisions as well. So, um, I think that's all I was going to say on the provisions that are, are in force. No doubt people will have some questions about that, but I'm sure we can leave some time for that at the end. Yes, we do have um, questions coming in, that's for sure. And I, I think, Simon, you're definitely right. This seems like a lot more non-contentious, more very industry-specific or maybe specific to certain roles. So it is quite different. With the workplace um, delegates' rights, so it, because it's come into effect on the 15th, but obviously the awards won't really show too much until we're looking at you know mid next year. Do you, would you say that businesses should just start gearing up if they are unionized or if they are dealing with 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 this environment? Yeah, well the the the, the law um, applies already. It's it's not it's not saying um, if you're covered by an award, these rules won't apply till the 1st of July. It's the, these rules apply for, to everyone already. It's just that um, from July, there will be some additional provisions, um, industry specific stuff. So I, I think businesses need to be, um, yeah, aware of this um, straight away. I mean, it, it will only affect you if you are notified that um, someone has been appointed as the workplace delegate. So um, until that time, uh, it's it's very difficult to plan for because you're not going to know, you know, even if you get a workplace delegate appointed, who who are they going to represent? It, it's a, it's only if an employee wants to be represented. So it's you know it's it's difficult to plan for, but I, I think it, it would be wrong to kind of turn a blind eye to it. Yeah, no, definitely worthwhile to keep you know. At least front of mind or knowing that this is this is what's changed in the space especially if you as an employer hr professional are in this space um now we want to put it actually to you and and see how you feel about these particular changes that have already been passed what we're going to do is do we've got a few polls here so um how does everyone feel are you supportive of the parts of the bill that have been passed um you know as of the 14th and, um, and go ahead and, and provide your answers. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave it open and then we'll discuss it in our next poll. Yes, there's more. <laughs> so we will talk about it in, in our next poll after we, we look at all of the changes that might come up. But it's always a might because they are contentious areas. <laughs> yeah, okay, very good. So let's, let's uh, jump into um, the provisions which will be debated um, next year it, it would probably be early next year but not before um february just because of the parliamentary timetable what's already before them um I, I think it's pretty likely that um most of this stuff is going to be um uh the government will push it through but it, it, until until you know that is done you can never say with certainty and, and what amendments to it um are are going to happen but i think it's 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 pretty likely so um, just running through um, uh, these provisions. Okay, so the biggest, and, and as Sanam said, this is the more contentious stuff. So this is the stuff um, which um, is, is probably going to have a bigger impact uh, on most workplaces. So the first thing, and probably the biggest thing, is, is inserting into the Fair Work Act a new definition of casual employment. So just to give that some context, 
um, the previous government, for the first time in 2021, inserted into the Fair, Fair Work Act a definition of casual employment. Before that, there was, there was, it was just kind of up to everyone to, to kind of guess exactly what it meant. But from 2021, we've had a definition of casual employment. And what that says at the moment is um, uh, the test of whether someone is a true casual or a permanent employee is decided upon by looking at the terms of their contract. So what was agreed by the employer and the employee at the time that the employee was first engaged? Was there um, a, a, a lack of a uh, firm commitment to ongoing work? If so, if the contract is set up so that it's um, there's no commitment to ongoing um, work, they're a casual employee, you don't need to then look at what happened after the contract was formed. It doesn't matter if the employee ends up working regular hours, say. You, you're just looking at, at what was the agreement between the parties at the time the contract was entered into. So the, the good thing about that is it provided um, certainty for employers and it got away from the situation of where you think you've engaged someone as casual, they end up working regular hours and they've kind of morphed into a permanent employee and you end up having to pay them backdated annual leave and sick leave and public holiday uh, absences and, and that kind of stuff. So the, the bill proposes to um, scrap that and to return to a situation where um, the definition of casual employment includes... Um, the whole assessment of kind of the whole relationship, not just what the agreement was between the parties. If they end up doing regular work, that could mean that they are a permanent employee, not a a, a casual. So it, re it, it goes back to this kind of uncertainty. Um, some commentators would say that, that we had avoided previously. Um, Secondly, the bill changes the rules around casual conversion. So at the moment, we have how the law operates is if the casual employee has been employed for at least 12 months and sorry, if, if they've been employed for 12 months and at least the last six months of those, they've been working a regular pattern of work. Um, they, If they are employed by a business with 15 or more employees, they have a right at that 12-month anniversary to request conversion to permanent employment, but, but the employer can refuse that on reasonable business grounds. Works very similar for small businesses. Um, after 12 months of employment, if the employee has worked six months in a regular pattern, the employee can request conversion to um, conversion, but they, they it's not a proactive obligation on the employer to to offer a conversion, uh, the uh, the employee has a right to request it. Uh, and again, it can be refused on, on reasonable business grounds. What, what the new legislation proposes to do is to scrap that process um, and have uh, an ability for employees to um, notify their employer that they consider that they are no longer a casual employee um, they are then um, converted to permanent employment and there are very, very limited grounds on which an employer can object to that. Um, a, a casual employee in a small business, um, again, th this, this kicks in at, at 12 months, but for anyone with more than 15, with 15 or more employees, they will have that right after six months of employment. So, um, yeah, greater rights for, for casuals to convert uh, and very limited um, um, abilities for employers to object to that. Um, so that's casual employment. O on a similar note, uh, there is proposed to be a, a definition inserted to, into the Fair Work Act of employment, which will affect the employee versus contractor test, the test of whether someone is, is a true contractor or an employee. And again, um, currently we have a situation following some 
court decisions a couple of years ago, where the test of whether someone is a contractor or an, or an employee is determined by looking at the contract between them. What did they agree at the start of the engagement? Um, if the terms of the contractor, sorry, if the terms of the contract point to a contractor engagement, you then don't have to look at how the parties treated each other after the contract was formed. It is just what was the agreement at the time. Um, whereas, as with casual employment, the, the bill proposes to change the definition. So once again, you have to look at the whole relationship and consider um, how the parties acted after the contract was formed, not just what their intention was at, at the start. So again, the criticism is, is uh, that there will be less certainty for employers that they have engaged someone as a true contractor. Um, and of course, the the penalties for <clears throat> engaging someone as a contractor when they should have been an employee, so-called sham contracting, are are very high. Um, on a related point, at number four, um, businesses currently can avoid um, the sham contracting penalty if they can show that they reasonably believed. Um, that uh, sorry, uh, it, they they can avoid the um, um, the penalty if 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 they can show that they weren't reckless to um, whether someone should be uh, uh, an employee versus a contractor. Whereas the the legislation proposes to change change the defence from uh, a recklessness test to a reasonableness test. So um, it will be um, harder for a business to show that um, they um, had a reasonable belief that someone should have been a contractor rather than an employee. Um, it, it just means avoiding that penalty is, is going to be harder. Um, number five, sticking with contractors. There will be a new ability for contractors who earn less than a certain amount. That amount hasn't been um, uh, specified, um, and I expect it will change uh, each year. But co contractors who earn less than a specified amount will have an ability to challenge unfair contract terms in the Fair Work Commission. Um, and number six, there is a proposal generally to increase penalties under the Fair Work Act for breaching employment laws by um, uh, by about five times, uh, so a five-fold increase. So the penalties, which were already pretty high, uh, are going to go up. Um, there are greater rights for unions. We already saw under the, the parts of the bill which have been passed some, some greater rights for unions, um, uh, but there are even more. The usual rule is where a union wants to um, come onto a work site to uh, investigate underpayments or, or um, uh, lack of employees being provided in proper entitlements. They would need to give 24 hours notice in a prescribed format. The proposal is that if they want to come on site to investigate an underpayment, they don't need to give any notice at all. Um, at number eight, there are some um, proposed new rights for what are called what are being called employee-like workers on digital platforms and in the road transport industry. So, digital platforms think things like Uber, um, Mabel, that, those sorts of things. Contractors who are working um, through those um, platforms but are treated in in many respects akin to employees, there will be new rights for them. And, and similarly for um, contractors in the road transport industry, which is usually going to be what are called owner drivers. So people who own cars or trucks and, and contract to businesses to do delivery work and the like. Um, the Fair Work Commission will have uh, a new power to set minimum terms for them. So think minimum wages, um, think you know, something akin to a modern award for these types of contractors. And they are, um, it is proposed, going to have 
a right similar to unfair dismissal. So an ability to challenge, um, you know, uh, a deactivate activation of their um, account on a digital platform or, or, or the end of their contractor agreement. Um, so all of that is in the um, bill all, already. So you can see the, the detail of that as is proposed. Um, there is also uh, being de debated by the government and and some of the other um, uh, in independent politicians um, a right to disconnect. So we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, um, but this will be something about uh, an employee being um, having a right not to have any interactions with their employer after their work day is finished or, or while we're on holiday or, or that sort of thing. It's all about protecting them from, you know, having to respond to emails or Slack messages or, or that kind of stuff. But we're going to have to see um, how that um, plays out. So I think I think that was all I was going to say on that, Sanam. When I usually do these things, I always say we'll leave some time for questions and we never, never do have any time. So I'm, I'm pleased that... <laughs> Um, we've still got um, just over 10 minutes to go. I, I told everyone we were training for this, Simon. We were, yeah. we were ready to yeah. go. We knew that these were coming. So we have definitely had a lot of questions come through. This is just the second um, poll as well that that um, that we've got. If you can participate in that, that will be great because we want to hear from you. What do you think about the, the, the proposed changes? Now, in terms of what people are saying about whether the first half is actually impacting them, what, what has actually been enacted, or, or past, uh, we we have forty percent of people saying saying yes that they're supportive of it, but but we do have forty five that are saying unsure. So that's quite interesting. Um, I think with with the way that it kind of came all about as well, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of employers. I, I also felt the same way of not being an employer, but just <laughs> in general that this was this was quite a shock and quite confusing. So hopefully this has provided a little bit of information. Now the second poll question is uh, about whether you're supporting the proposed changes, and um, and and we'll definitely um, have a chat about that once we get into the the next poll. But for now, the most important part. <laughs> Because Simon, it's it's all us. <laughs> is the Q and A. We're going to get into all of the questions now. I'm going to be honest. We were sent through a lot of questions that might not be specifically on topic, but Simon, I will keep it as close to topic as possible. Uh, a lot of these are actually relating to fixed term contracts or relating, um, you know, to to different aspects of the bill. So I'll kick off with the first one, um, which is to do with. Um, just bear with me. So um, it's to do with a fixed term contract. I know that we briefly touched on it in the beginning as a 2023 change, but uh, can an employer hire an employee on a three year fixed term contract if the project, um, let's say it's you know uh, something that's done by government grant is funded for three years? So there is a specific exemption for um, government funded work but uh, and it's really important to understand this how the exemption is worded is it says you can rely on this exemption if um, the work you're doing is government funded and there is no reasonable prospect of that funding being renewed so it, it is really aimed at projects where you have government funding for a particular project, say it's a three-year project, so you wanted to, you know, um, avoid the, the restrictions because you want to have a, a three-year contract, which the law prohibits, so you need to rely on it, an exemption. Um, if if the, the funding you have been given is you're being told, you know, this is a funding we've got in place for, for this one-off project, we're not going to give you any more funding after it, then, yeah, you can rely on that. Contrast that with a situation such as um, uh, an, an NDIS provider who gets ongoing funding from um, the, uh, the government as long as they are, um, uh, you know, servicing NDIS clients, 
if you if you know that funding is likely to continue, if you've been operating in this sector for a while and you've always had funding in place, um, you're not going to be able to rely on that exemption. So it is not an exemption just because you're government funded. You can you can have um, fixed term contracts outside of the rules. You need to show that the funding is there's no reasonable prospect of it being continuing that justifies you being able to say to your employee well i can only employ you till the end of that funding because it doesn't look like it's going to be renewed mm -hmm. um, there might be another exemption you could rely on if it is for i don't know that there are exemptions which deal with um, highly paid employees or employees um, that uh, have a specialism that you do not have in, in the business. So it, it, it might be that there is an exemption you can rely on, but yeah, if, if you want more information on that, um, yeah, do, do get in touch and we can, we can try and help you out. Perfect. Um, and we've got quite a lot of questions that have come in around the labor hire situation, which yeah. I, I didn't think it would, would come up this, this much, but I'll try to kind of pull them all together. Uh, basically, what, what people are asking is what happens when you've got quarterly bonuses for your permanent employees and that are performing the same role? Do they need, does the labor hire employees need to also be paid this? And also, um, you know, would they just be paid base rates of, of pay? How, how would it work? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really, um, it's a, Really interesting uh, question, um, and I don't think the the legislation is um, super clear on um, uh, how this operates. But um, it, it 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 seems to be designed so that. Um, the obligation is to match um, the minimum entitlement in the um, enterprise agreement. So if you happen to be paying employees uh, above that as a kind of discretionary uh, overpayment or, or, or a bonus, then that isn't going to that isn't going to be what the labor hire company is going to. Um, match um, but uh, yeah the the the, the legislation it ha hasn't it, one of the criticisms about it is it hasn't been super clear on on how you carry out that assessment of what what needs to be matched but um, it's an interesting question I, I'll have I'll have a look a bit more of a look into that as well and we can um, we can definitely include some um, some more stuff about that in in our follow up follow up comms. Perfect. No, I think that's definitely good because we have had them quite steadily trickling in. And um, what some of the questions that have come up are, are around um, the the workplace delegate. Um, yep. The first one is, do all workplaces need to have a delegate? And I think from this webinar, it's a no. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's a no. It's it's a no. no number one, you can only be a workplace delegate if you're um, you know, appointed by the union. So you, you're going to need to be a member of that union. When I say you, I'm, I'm talking about the employee. So um, if you don't have union members, you're not going to have workplace delegates. If you do have union members, it is only where someone is uh, appointed as a workplace delegate by the union that there'll be one. Um, and and the third thing, I suppose, is they're not going to have anyone to represent unless employees are opting in to be represented by the delegate. Oh, uh, and this, but, this kind of branches, Simon, sorry to, to cut you up, but this branches onto one of the questions I saw, which I thought was quite interesting. When the delegate is the support person, do they just, can they speak on the employee's behalf? Is that is that completely fine? That's, that's a great question. That's a really good question. Um, so uh, the 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 answer to that is if they are um, acting as in their capacity as a workplace delegate, then yes, they would be able to um, speak on on the person they're representing's behalf. Um, 
uh, if they were just acting as a support person, then they they um, you know wouldn't ordinarily be able to do so. So if you had a situation where you've invited someone to to a disciplinary meeting, say you've said you can bring a a support person with you, and they rock up with someone who you know is the workplace delegate, or they might inform you they're the workplace delegate. I think best practice would be to ask them, are you here in as, in your capacity as a support person or as a workplace delegate? They're probably going to say, I'm here as both, in which case you would have to, um, uh, you know, let, let them speak. But, um, yeah, if, if the employee said, no, I know they're the workplace delegate, but actually I don't want them to represent me, they're just here as my support person. I mean, then they wouldn't be able to, but that's probably unlikely to to to, uh, to occur. So back on to the delegate conversation <laughs> um, and continuing on with it. It is getting really interesting because the questions that we're getting are, are very specific. And, and I thought maybe if you could shed some light on, and I, and I don't think we have an answer to this, to be honest, until we kind of see it tested. What happens if the, the delegates' responsibilities begin to impact their actual work? I mean, we're meant to give them, you know, the training. We're meant to give them reasonable time. How how does an employer assess the word reasonable? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a great it's a great question again. I mean, all all of the rights for the delegates are um, expressed in terms of reasonableness they must have reasonable communication with the people they represent they must be given reasonable access to workplace facilities they must be given reasonable time off to do union training so it's all all reasonable you know it's all there's a limit to what they need to be provided and and the limit is when something is unreasonable as opposed to reasonable and then the legislation lists the things that um, you would take into account um, in assessing reasonableness, such as the, the size of the business um, um, uh, and its resources, that, that kind of thing. But, you know, it, it is it, reasonableness is inherently a, a grey area. So it's, it's very hard to advise, you know, specifically on, on that question. But, but if it is the case that, you know the the business's productivity is is suffering as a result of their activities, and you can kind of pinpoint that. And um, then you you would be able to um, you know uh, object to them carrying out you know the particular activity you're you're talking about. But I think you you would need to be able to ideally show kind of tangibly. You know, it's it's unreasonable for you to have these meetings at this time of the day because that's business critical time where we need you know everyone answering the phones or what whatever it is. But yeah, you, you're going to need to be able to kind of justify why that is unreasonable. I would say. Okay, so there there is hope after all, <laughs> so people can um you know rely on some sort of justification. But obviously, it it is a test at the end of the day. So. You know, sometimes you have to give the benefit of the doubt um, up to a certain point, of course. And uh, a couple of questions that we did receive were around the first responders um, and what the, uh, you know, with the uh, the PTSD side of things. What, what would be the definition of a, of a first responder? Do, do we have that under the Act or? Is yeah, there... it, it is. It is in there. Um, uh, so, again, we can we can confirm okay. the exact yeah. details, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's paramedics, firefighters, um uh police uh, i can't remember if there's something in there about um you know uh uh defense forces but but it, it is it is particular um public sector um workers in those professions it, it, it is not um uh you know uh, a a kind of uh undefined um, term whereby if you're a private employer, you might be able to say, well, my employees deal with stressful situations. They're, they're working in a 
um, I don't know, uh, a situation where sometimes they they come across traumatic events. It, it is one of those named professions, so it's unlikely to provide um, assistance to a, a private um, employer. But I, I'll I'll give you a chapter and verse on that in 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 the responses that we sent out. Okay. Perfect. Well, I mean, I think we, we've gotten through um, a fair few questions, but there is still a lot, lot more. So what we will do is we will try to, like I said, endeavour to get to them after this webinar. Uh, I am mindful that a lot of people must be wrapping up businesses and things like that. So we will try to get them out um, as, as quick as we can. In terms of the um, polls that have, have come up, um, we have the second poll that we did. Um, and it will be really good to, to kind of see exactly what's um, what's happened or what, what people are thinking about um, all of these proposed changes in legislation. In terms of this particular poll, um, this one is solely based on how you feel in 2024 with all this information going in, how do you feel about the, the pressures on your business? And, um, and, and, you know, how do you think it's going to impact you with what we've discussed? I can see a lot of um, industry specific questions that have come in, Simon. So it, it you know, I'm, I'm feeling the pressure from, <laughs> from, from just the, the Q and A. So, <laughs> so I think definitely it'll be an interesting one, but I just wanted to, um, as we're wrapping up and I, I will discuss the, the third poll as well. Um, but as we're wrapping up, I just wanted to say, um, you know, what, what a year it's been. Uh, like, like I mentioned earlier on, we've absolutely seen so many changes across, you know, the, the fair work legislation, across different legislations, cases have come up and changed things. So if, if you're dealing with anything in particular in the workplace, a lot of questions came out of this. And if you have anything specific that you're dealing with, I did see a few specific ones there, then please feel free to reach out to, to Simon at EI Legal. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge been doing employment law <laughs> for, for quite some time and knows it inside and out. So please absolutely reach out. Um, I've put the details on the screen there as well for, for you to contact him. And um, what we'll do as well at the end of this um, presentation is that a survey will pop up automatically. So if you could please participate, Simon and I would love to know how we did, if we did all right, <laughs> if there's anything we can improve on. But the next time we always love to, to get some feedback so we can tweak things. And, um, and like I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out some additional information um, and resources along with this webinar recording and the slides. So please keep a, an eye out for that. And we will be trying to get to as many questions as possible. So um, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna double check and see if we've got the poll otherwise. Oh, perfect. Um, so with the poll results that came up just before we, we head off with poll two, we've got, 49% of people saying that they're a bit unsure about how they feel about the areas that haven't been passed. I think that translates into the questions as well uh, because it is a lot of confusion and, and I hope that this has given you a good amount of information. I'm sure Simon, um, you know, the, the, the overview that he's given was really good. <laughs> I think it's a lot more complicated and, and it was a great run through of what to potentially expect. So, um, so, so that's absolutely great. And, when it comes to poll three, before we wrap up, do we have um, the answers for that one? I will just double check. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so we're still looking a little bit unsure, I see, but it will get worse is not giving me the the, the best feeling <laughs> for Simon. So, so I think, it, you know, if, if you could take anything away from this, and I'm sure Simon, you will agree, Please walk away from this knowing that you are one step ahead, even though um, some things have been changed on the 15th, we're not too far in. Uh, so there is time for you, for you to, to look at your contracts, look at your policies, fix things. And even 2023's changes as well that have come up this year, there's still time. There always is, um, it, you know, except for when you're down to, <laughs> to a claim from an employee. But usually, usually there's quite a bit of time. So, so please have a look at that. And um, yeah, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And a safe and happy holiday. Simon, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. I, I hope everyone um, enjoyed. And I can see from the chat, everybody really did as well. So thank you. Thanks, Sanam. And yeah, thanks, everyone. Have a, have a great holiday. All right, brilliant. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye.